out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The rich will shake at the force of his word, <clears throat> and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The, the lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of the cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in the nest of, a, of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. So uh, I was thinking this morning as I was reading the text or this week about peace. And um, I want to describe a, a peace situation in my life. that It's more of a dream than a reality, but at my best Christmas Eve, uh, I'd be back in Bethlehem, nothing against Dubuque, okay? I'm just telling you that this is the place where I'm rooted and I feel... Anyway, I'd be walking home from church. It'd be the Christmas Eve service, dark, cool at night, uh, snow, uh, big snowflakes. You can almost hear them hitting the ground. Um, everything's muffled. There's snow on branches, so it's been snowing for a while. In the distance, you can hear uh, snow chains clicking or t jingling. Um, there's... Um, when you look at street lights, there's kind of a halo effect because of the snow, and the snow's just coming out of darkness, and if, wherever there's light, you can see it falling. It's kind of a wet snow. Everything's muffled. Everything's peaceful. And you just feel when you're out there walking, like, man, this is, this is what, maybe this is what Eden felt like, even though, you know, if you're from other parts of the world, you don't want snow. But there's just something about that sense for me that just speaks peace. Now, I know that that image is artificial because I know for me it's an experience of peace, but somewhere a crime is occurring. Somewhere someone is hurt and they're being rushed to the hospital. Life is still outside that little cocoon that I'm experiencing. Life is still going on. For me, that's peace. But it's transitory. It's not going to last. I'm either going to get home and uh, there'll be an argument in the family or uh, I, I don't know. I mean, this is just the way life is. But I don't know how many, how many times have you felt that? How many times have you been blessed to have this moment of peace in some kind of circumstance where you're like, this is it. You know, this is, oh, what, what, I want this taste to continue. I want to. I want to be able to devour this, and yet it's so fleeting. It, it disappears. It's, it just dissipates into the air. It's just, you know, the snow gets dirty and ugly, and now you want it to go away. <laughs> I mean, the image that uh, we hear in today's passage in Isaiah is not going to disappear. The image that uh, we get in this second week of Advent is a permanent image. It is... It's a hope that is given to Israel, and it's a hope that's given to us that we can look forward to. I remember hearing um, that if there's no hope, there's no life. You can't live without hope. Um, and that's our hope as Christians, is this kind of an image. And I pray that um, the songs we sung, sang this morning would kind of 
help us with this because, um, so like breathe, for example. My prayer for us would be that we would breathe in this image in Isaiah. That it would become part of us like, like breathing is part of us. Um, good, good father. This image tells us of how good our father is. This, the good, good father creates this thing in our lives and in our future, something we can hope for. Uh, come Holy Spirit, this is going to happen through the Holy Spirit. This, this is not some kind of dream. This is a reality that's coming. And Christmas is the hope about it. The Christmas points us to this. This is what we're hoping for as we Advent, we wait for the birth of the Christ child. But for us as 21st century Christians, we hope for Christ to come again. So if I go back to that image of peace for me, that was a silent night. It was a holy night. All was calm and all was bright. I've experienced that sort of evening rarely over my 64 years. Uh, it doesn't always snow on Christmas Eve. And, but when I get that, oh, I, I just relish it. So today's, uh, that idea is presented in today's text. And again, it's a permanent reality. So I want to look at the first, the middle portion of today's text, because it describes the world in the reign of the Messiah. So this is a messianic text. It's telling us about Jesus. At least it's been applied to Jesus. But let me, let's just start with the reign. What does the world look like when the Messiah is totally 100% in charge? So let me just start by reading. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will lay down together. The leopard will lay down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. The cow will ga graze near the, the bear. The cub and the calf will lay down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of the cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Domesticated animals will no longer be in danger from predators. Bears and lions will lay down with cows and sheep. The basic natures of these animals is radically changed because now a lion will eat hay. This is something that only God can do. And it says that when it, a child will put its hand in a deadly snake's nest without harm. Well, the snakes are no longer deadly because they've been changed in their very character and in the traits they've already known or always known. The basic character traits have been altered by the bringing in of the kingdom of God in all its fullness. Now, you and I have not experienced that. We can get hints of it. We can get little sneak peeks. But the fullness has not come yet. It says that the weakest and most vulnerable of all humanity, children, will no longer have anything to fear. They can play with snakes. They can, they can go up to a lion and pet it. And they will not be uh, eaten or killed. And if children have no fear from natural animal predators, it appears that they won't have to fear their own kind either. In our day and time, children are the most vulnerable. And in a fallen world, children have paid the greatest price. They're trafficked. They're abused. Um, they're taken away from their families. They're turned over into prostitution. They're in refugee camps. They're starving. They're dying. But in this picture of the world, the most vulnerable and the least valuable are safe. That is who our God is. That is what we look for. That is the hope that we have. And it says a little child will lead them. And that could be a hint of who Jesus Christ is. Because he comes as a little child. 
and he is God incarnate in that little child. But the children are safe. And if the most vulnerable and the weakest are safe, can I just say that adults don't need to worry either? Uh, this is just an amazing picture. Now, some of us have been blessed to be born into relatively high-functioning families, whatever that means. Uh, I never had to worry about anything as a child. My parents weren't necessarily wealthy. Uh, we lived on one income. My dad was a clerk at the steel. Uh, but they provided for what we needed most. Uh, we were a secure family structure most of the time. Uh, but we don't usually get to pick and choose the circumstances and the parents that we're born into. And there are people in this world who did not receive a blessed family to live in. Uh, one of the people who came through our doors, I remember him telling me a story. His mom hit him over the head with a beer bottle. I expect that his life experience was radically different from mine. And he had, that, that experience paid great dividends, negative dividends in his life. Through no fault of his own, this was a reality that he dealt with and it shaped him uh, and he had to live it. But this picture from Isaiah tells us that that kind of stuff will be overcome and it will no longer exist. Praise God, praise God. The world we live in is fallen, but this new thing that Isaiah is talking about removes that for something new. The fallenness will go away. We were reading the text, well, I'll read it later, but it says, when the new earth and the new heaven come, we won't remember what was old. So, you know, you are reborn, you are made new without the memories of your mistakes or the circumstances that, that came against you. Isn't it is a blessing to be made new without a memory of the negatives, right? So who is this leader? The beginning part. But look, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies will... Uh, oh, well, let me just say, the context in this situation is a fallen world. And in chapter 10, uh, we find out that there are more stumps than just the stump that's mentioned in chapter 11. In fact, Assyria had taken over Israel and uh, exiled people, shipped them out, uh, and sent them elsewhere. Uh, and so in chapter 10, we learn this, that the Assyrian king who thinks he's important, uh, this is what this says, but look, the Lord, of, the Lord of heaven's armies will chop down the mighty tree of Assyria with great power, and he will cut down the proud. That lofty tree will be brought down. He will cut down the forest trees with an ax, Lebanon will fall to the mighty one. There is clear cut across the world. All nations are like stumps. There's nothing but stumps. And yet there is one stump in which a shoot is coming up. Uh, Israel has experienced the exile at the hands of the Assyrians. Their proud king thinks that he's just, he's just the best there is. The God, the mighty one, will chop down all of Assyria, all kingdoms of the world, and, and there is something that new is going to happen. So out of that old stump that's Israel, there will be a shoot. It says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verses 1 and 2. The old root is the promise made to Abram back in Genesis 12. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. From the very beginning of the call of Abram and the formation of Israel, they were to be the people of God who were a blessing to the nations. All people on earth would be blessed by them. But sin enters, as it always does, and Israel became in lo inward looking, and they not, didn't become a blessing to the nations. They only wanted to bless themselves. But it says here that our God blessed people through their association and cooperation with this family of Abram through history. Again, over time, this family ceased to be a blessing. They just looked inward. 
But then God acted, and in the town of Bethlehem, many, many, many years later, God sent Samuel a prophet to the family of Jesse, who was the father, and then Jesse's son, who was David, the youngest of his sons, and David was anointed king. It says in 1 Samuel, so as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took a flask of oil, he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The Spirit of the Lord anointed David powerfully, and he became the most famous king of Israel to the point that all kings are, uh, are rated according to David. He is the set mark by which all other kings would be rated. But even David's tree was chopped down. And there's just a stump, but there's a shoot. There's hope wrapped up in that moment of anointing. That there is something to be reborn again in this new thing that Isaiah is talking about. It says that this leader will be filled with the Spirit. Notice what the Spirit's influence is on this new leader. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. This is not, I believe, our modern conception of what being spirit and doubt is all about. We expect to fall over or speak ecstatically or maybe do miracles or anything, but, and yet here the Messiah is given the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not speaking in tongues. He's not falling over, being slain in the Spirit. He has wisdom and knowledge and fear of the Lord. This is what makes him a good leader. Leadership that is uncommon in our experience and in the experience of Israel. The, these traits make him different from everything we know when we look at leaders in the ancient world and even in the world today. Verses 3 through 5 says this, He will delight in the obeying of the Lord because he fears the Lord. He will delight in the obeying of the Lord. He won't grit through his teeth, I'll obey you. He delights in obeying the Lord. He wants to obey the Lord. And he will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based upon hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In our world right now, we don't know anything about judgment in this way. We have never experienced justice and righteousness in the way described in verses 3 through 5. And as even in our highest, best moments, we have never exercised judgment in this way. Because we have biases that infect and blind us to the way we deal with the people around us, whether we want to or not. Now, some people are more in the know of their own issues and biases than others, but we all benefit from decisions based upon faulty logic or powerful relationships or many other criteria. So, for example, uh, for five years, I've run our dog, Raven. I throw Frisbees, and she runs flat out as fast as she can over at the grass field at Loris College. The field is clearly marked that it's only for Loris faculty and students to use. But since I live on Henyon and we have to endure uh, students going back and forth, I feel that I have a privilege that other people don't necessarily have. So for five years, I've been running our dog over there. If there's students there, I don't run her. I clean up after her. Uh, I try to protect the students. So that makes it another reason why I should be able to do it, because I take care of their grounds. I care. A month ago, the security guy came and told me I can't do this. Well, if he said I can't do it, I can't do it. Because I'm a legalist in my head. I can't break a, I know I was breaking a rule, but now that I've been informed, I can't break the rule. So I would bring her over here 
So a 10 minute job becomes a 20 to 40 minute job. And I said, you know what? This is just inconvenient. So I emailed Jim Collins, the president of Loris College, because I can. I know him. I've met him. We're not pals. I asked him for a favor, and he granted it. But he did say, Tim, why you and not all the other neighbors? And again, my response would be, not all the other neighbors live on Henyon, and I clean up after my dog. I'm privileged. Now, Claudette's informed me the fact that I even thought about sending that email points out how privileged I really am. Because there's other folks who would never do that. And I will argue that I thought clearly and long about doing it, but I still did it because it's an inconvenience for me to not be able to do it. Can I just say that that's not justice? That's not righteousness. That's privilege pulling its weight. I'm not proud of that. I'm just happy I can do it. He said, sure, do it. Because my life is easier. But that's kind of how our world works. There are people who have no voice. There are people who have no connections. And maybe what they want is right but they can't voice it, and it'll never be acted on. But that will not be in the kingdom of God. In this new kingdom that's on the horizons, judgment will be made based not on appearance or feelings or biases or connections, but from facts and mercy. This ruler wears righteousness and truth as if it were the clothing that he puts on every day. Righteousness and truth are a part of who he is, part and parcel to him. Just as cheating and deceit are part of who we are when we really dig deep. So we will, they, this will have indeterminable effect on the world. What, what does it mean when you have a leader who leads this way? who is honest and just, and it is just in the core of their being. They are, even when no one can see them, this is who they are. This is how they act. This is how they think. It, it affects everybody in the world. It says here, nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. And that day, the heir of David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Wouldn't it be a glorious place to experience that now? Wouldn't that be a glorious thing? I believe so. There will, in the holy mountain where God reigns, in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no harm in the land. People will know the Lord. People will flock to the generous, fruitful, safe place. Just as God had promised to Abram, they will be blessed. So they will be blessed when they flock to Jesus, the root of Abram and David. They will be blessed through this shoot from David's family. They will be blessed and be prosperous and be healthy and experience justice and peace and be safe. That is what Advent speaks to us about as we wait for the coming of Jesus. We await the second coming as we await the coming of Christmas. We anxiously hunger and thirst for the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ in the world and also in ourselves. Because if we're honest, we know where we break the code. And we know where we're just like the people we criticize. We, we can... We can connect. We know we might not believe it and we might want to hide it, but we know that we are just like the people we make accusations about. And we tire of this disease. We are tired of war and storms and prejudice and wrongful incarceration and trafficking and prostitution and refugee status and starvation we are tired of this and this is what advent says in the midst of this we have a hope of something greater and bigger the promise 
in Isaiah 11 says. This is what's coming. And it's coming through Jesus Christ. In the meantime, though, we have to ask ourselves, how can we help this kingdom be born in our own personal lives? How can this start flourishing in us so that we can be a banner of salvation to the people around us who are hurting? Because that's the church's job. That's what our call is. Last year, when I had my heart attack, Jim filled in, and he talked about how many of the kids he's dealt with in school hate Christmas because it has no correlation to their life. And the argument I would give back, and I think it was the point that Jim made, is because the church is not doing its job. We are not a banner of salvation to people. We are come across more as a banner of judgment to people. Christ has called us to live out the Isaiah 11 picture. It, we can't do it perfectly. We need the mighty power of God. Come Holy Spirit, good, good Father, breathe. We need it to infuse in us in new ways. But even at its best, it will not be But we need to be the ambassadors that Christ has called us to be. If you read through the Gospels, and we'll be hitting Matthew next week, this is what got Jesus in trouble. He refused the status quo. He refused to abide by the kingdom of this world, and instead he was a representative of the kingdom of the world to come. And that's what you and I must be. That's what you and I are called to be. That's what you and I are empowered to be. Amen? It's our task, it's our destiny, and to God be the glory as we turn our hearts and minds to Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we need Your help more than anything else. It is so easy for us to rest in what we know, rest in our life experiences, instead of blazing into the new world You're creating. We all have a certain fear about the impact of Isaiah 11 in our own personal lives and journeys. We like what we hear, and yet to enact it brings us great fear. Fear because we could be ostracized. Fear because it could require that we give things up. But Lord, we want to move forward. We want to be your ambassador ambassadors of a banner of salvation and love of the new kingdom, the new heaven, the new earth, the place, the, the new place where there will be no memory of the old.